Good morning. I want to thank Professor Voice and his organizing team for inviting me to this important meeting of the Polish Physical Society to beautiful Wroclaw and for giving me the opportunity to talk about what's perhaps my favorite subject, laser spectroscopy of hydrogen. Spectroscopy, of course, is an old field. Uh, Wroclaw played a pivotal role when Gustav Kirchhoff in the middle of the 19th century uh, was a professor here and Robert Bunsen came to Wroclaw and they became friends and together they developed spectral analysis as a tool for chemistry. They uh, would look at the spectral lines emitted by hot elements and use these lines as fingerprints to identify different elements. When particular spectrum uh, that is very simple and that played a fundamental role in the development of quantum physics is the Balmer spectrum of the simple hydrogen atom. And this spectrum has inspired a whole series of path-breaking discoveries from Bohr to Sommerfeld to Schrodinger, Dirac, Lamb, and before telling you about modern spectroscopy of hydrogen, let me briefly recall the historical steps uh, that led to major advances. In the late 19th century, Balmer had come up with a formula to describe the wavelengths of these visible lines of hydrogen, and Rydberg had generalized this Balmer formula, and in this context, introduced an empirical constant, the Rydberg constant. <clears throat> At that time, still nobody had any idea why atoms emit spectral lines, how they do it, but at least in case of hydrogen, the lines seem to follow a rule, a simple mathematical rule. Then, later, after Rutherford had discovered the nucleus of atoms, uh, Niels Bohr came up with his planetary atom model, where he assumed, uh, in a drastic, non-classical way, that electrons orbiting, or the electron orbiting this proton nucleus, would only be allowed into special stable orbits, and that radiation is emitted or absorbed in jumps between these energy levels. This model had many shortcomings, but it allowed Bohr to express the Rydberg constant in terms of the electron mass, the electron charge, Planck's constant, the speed of light. And uh, this uh, was in very good agreement with the measured Rydberg constant, so people felt there must be something to this radical, non-classical approach to atomic physics. Uh, Max Born, who was born here in Wroclaw, and Werner Heisenberg uh, struggled with the shortcomings of this early model and developed uh, what's now known as matrix mechanics. And we know, we know nowadays that this is equivalent to the wave mechanics uh, developed by Du Bois and Schrodinger. Du Bois argued maybe these stable orbits in the hydrogen atom are those where the wavelengths of the electron matter wave uh, is an integer fraction of the circumference. And Schrodinger uh, actually came up with a wave equation for matter waves that we know as the Schrodinger equation, and that could be solved in closed form for an electron in a Coulomb potential, and uh, it gives us the probability distribution of finding the electron in different quantum states. With this one could actually predict the line strengths, the lifetimes of energy states. Then Dirac succeeded in formulating a relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and this seemed to be overwhelmingly successful 
because it not only included relativistic effects that give rise to the fine structure, but also it could describe the spin of the electron and even the existence of anti-electrons, of positrons. So this seemed to be a triumph of theory, and people felt this theory is so beautiful, it has to be right. But it turned out that it was not quite right. Willis Lamb, after the Second World War, used microwave spectroscopy of a hydrogen atomic beam to show that two energy levels that should be precisely the same, according to Dirac, the 2s state, the metastable state, and the 2p state, that they actually have different energies. And Hans Bede was the first to come up with some intuitive explanation. He said uh, vacuum fluctuations were ignored in the Dirac equation. And these fluctuating fields that are always present in vacuum, even at absolute zero temperature, they wiggle the electron around so that from the point of view of the electron, the nucleus appears smeared out. And in an S state, where the electron comes close to the nucleus, uh, uh, this then reduces the binding energy. There is another effect with the opposite sign, vacuum polarization, that the vacuum can behave like a dielectric due to the creation of virtual electron-positron pairs. These were the beginnings of uh, the development of quantum electrodynamics. And in 1965, the Nobel Prize was given to Tomonaga, Schwinger, and Feynman for these developments. So, but what about more modern studies of hydrogen? Uh, when I was a young postdoc at Stanford University working with Art Charlow, I came up with a way to make lasers, dye lasers, highly monochromatic, so that one could apply techniques of Doppler-free spectroscopy, in particular saturation spectroscopy, to any spectral lines in the tuning range of the laser. And one of the first lines to study was the red Balmer alpha line of hydrogen. Uh, before lasers, people were dealing with a broad line, a blend of Doppler broadened fine structure components. And with the help of the laser, it became possible to resolve individual fine structure components in the optical spectrum, and in particular to observe the lamp shift directly in the optical spectrum. That was a long time ago, 1972. Uh, at a conference, at uh, the first International Laser Spectroscopy Conference in 1973, I presented some of this work and I pointed out that uh, we are presently working in an attempt to utilize the optical resolution of hydrogen Balma alpha for a new precision measurement of the wavelengths of one of its components, which should yield a considerably improved value of the Rydberg constant, one of the cornerstones in the evaluation of the fundamental constants. So this was sort of a program that would keep us busy for a long time. And if we want to look at progress over time, uh, here is the fractional uncertainty versus time. And before lasers, uh, one could determine the Rydberg constant to maybe seven de decimal digits. And the limit was Doppler broadening. And in the course of the work, the frontier changed several times. So from the limit of Doppler burning, <coughs> we had <coughs> to learn how to utilize these line components without Doppler burning to measure the wavelengths. And of course, there were experts who could have helped us to measure it much faster. But we were working with graduate students in a somewhat amateurish way. Nonetheless, we made progress. And just when we had uh, reached the state of the art, uh, we uh, encountered the new obstacle that it's just not possible to measure wavelengths to better than a part in tens of ten or so. So then we had to learn how to measure not the wavelengths but the frequency of laser light. And just when we came up with a wonderful and elegant way of doing that, 
we encountered another obstacle, and that is uh, how well we know the size of the proton, the nucleus. Uh, Murray Gellman had postulated in the 60s that the uh, proton is a composite system made up of three quarks <coughs> held together by gluons. And Bob Hofstadter at Stanford University. <coughs> what, let's see, is there some? Maybe some. I, I should take a sip of water, right? Thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Uh, Bob Hofstadter uh, was the first to actually measure the size of the proton using a linear electron accelerator <coughs> at Stanford to scatter electrons of hydrogen nuclei. So we will come back to this question, how small is the proton? But, of course, uh, the accuracy of spectroscopy is not limited by, our, uh, by the proton size. And so, over the years, we pushed the fractional frequency uncertainty from uh, seven decimal digits to almost 15 decimal digits. Uh, the motivation for this kind of pursuit was uh, that we would like to test bound state QED. It's an odd theory. Uh, Maybe there's something better, but the way to find out if there's something better is to maybe find the limits of the theory, to find some contradiction between experiment and theory. And hydrogen is, of course, a good testing ground because it's so simple. Uh, th these kinds of measurements can give us improved values of fundamental constants, in particular the Rydberg constant and the proton size. One can address the question, whether fundamental constants are truly constant or perhaps slowly changing with time. There's also anti-hydrogen, so by comparing hydrogen and anti-hydrogen, we can test whether there might be tiny differences that perhaps could explain the prevalence of matter over antimatter in the universe. And altogether, it's a field where one has a hope to be able to search for new physics without giant and super expensive accelerators. Uh, one particular transition that uh, we concentrated on is a two-photon transition from the ground state of hydrogen to the metastable 2S state that was first observed in 1975 with uh, Carl Wyman, who uh, was one of my early doctoral students and later went on to win the Nobel Prize for was Einstein condensation of atoms. So this particular transition requires ultraviolet light at 243 nanometers. And in principle, if, they, if you use two counterpropagating beams, you get rid of first order Doppler broadening. And if you could make the atoms stand still, you could hope to observe the natural line width on the order of only one hertz. We still haven't learned how to make the atoms stand still. Uh, we still use a cold atomic beam. Uh, it would be nice if we could laser cool hydrogen atoms and there's some progress. But uh, so far, we use a cryostat, a helium cryostat, to cool hydrogen atoms by collisions. And <coughs> then this hydrogen beam <coughs> is propagating along a standing wave field inside the build up cavity. And when we excite atoms to the metastable 2S state, we can observe them by applying a quenching electric field. We emit uh, Lyman alpha photons that we can count. And to get the signal from extra slow atoms, we can put a chopper into the laser beam and look at delayed signal photons, those that can only come from atoms that are so slow that they're still around after a certain waiting time. And in doing that, we 
soon we're able to observe resonances as shown here, not with one hertz, but uh, maybe with half a kilohertz of line width. And with this, we could actually measure the frequency of this 1s, 2s transition in a heroic effort involving a large, complex, so-called harmonic laser frequency chain as the German National Metrology Institute and a Russian built methane stabilized helium neon laser that we would shuttle back and forth between Braunschweig and Gaching. But nonetheless, it, about 20 years ago, we had made a measurement that made it at the time the most accurate measurement of an ultraviolet or visible optical frequency. And from this, we got a new value of the Rydberg constant, which uh, we could claim was the most accurate fundamental constant. And from comparing different transitions in hydrogen, we could also measure the lamp shift of the ground state, uh, which at the time was the most accurate test of quantum electrodynamics for an atom. And also from spectroscopy, we could determine the charge radius of the proton. And from similar experiments in deuterium, the structure radius of the deuteron uh, which were 20 years ago the most accurate values of these uh, constants. So uh, this took 10 years of effort, and nowadays uh, it can be done more or less in an afternoon, uh, because <coughs> we have a new tool uh, that burst onto the scene at the, around 1999, the laser frequency comb. Uh, for the first time, it provided a simple tool for measuring the frequency of light. <clears throat> it provided a phase coherent link between the optical and the radio frequency region. And it can be used as a clockwork mechanism for optical atomic clocks. So what is a frequency comb? <clears throat> At the heart of a frequency comb, we have a mode-locked laser in most cases. And in the most elementary form, such a laser consists of an optical resonator, two mirrors with a pulse of light bouncing back and forth. And there is an amplifying medium, so we can keep it going, even though we couple out a train of ultra-short pulses. And these lasers were actually available at the time. There were hundreds of laboratories using mode-lock titanium sapphire lasers or dye lasers for the study of ultra-fast phenomena. But uh, people in frequency metrology didn't see any use for this type of laser, because if you take a short laser pulse and send it into a spectrometer, you have a broad spectrum. So what good is it for measuring the frequency of light? Well, if I take not one pulse, but two pulses, they can interfere in the spectrograph, and they will give a fringe pattern, a pattern of interference fringes, that's similar to a double slit experiment, except here the two pulses are separated in time and the fringes are separated in the spectrum. And the spacing of adjacent fringes is just the inverse time interval between the two pulses. So the farther apart the pulses are, the closer together these interference fringes move. And in a way, if you look at it, it looks like a comb. So, should, oops, I wanted to stop here, but... <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, if I have not two pulses, but many pulses, then, uh, just like moving from a double slit to a grating, I can get sharp spectral lines. And, of course, for it to work so well as in this animation, I need very precisely controlled timing. But that's, in essence, how a frequency comb is produced by a mode-locked laser. Uh, what most people found surprising is how far these elementary principles could be pushed. That you could take a titanium sapphire laser pulse of deep red light, send it through a special microstructured silica fiber, which through the nonlinear refractive index through self-phase modulation, broadens the spectrum so that it can span a whole rainbow of colors. But 
the pulses coming out of the fiber are still so well controlled that you still get a frequency comb and a comb that can span really an optical octave. If you uh, zoom in, you see that there are really comb lines. There might be a hundred thousand or a million uh, spectral lines, all precisely evenly spaced by the pulse repetition frequency. <coughs> in general, we don't know the absolute frequency of these comb lines because there can be a slippage of the phase of the carrier wave relative to the pulse envelope. But if I have an old octave, there are simple optical tricks to control the slippage so that then I have an optical frequency comb with precise integer harmonics of the repetition frequency. And I can use it in two ways. I can measure the repetition frequency and then I know the spacing and the absolute frequency of each of the comb lines. Or I can take a particular comb line and lock it to some atomic sharp resonance and then my frequency comb acts as a clockwork and the repetition frequency becomes a known integer fraction of this optical frequency. Today one can go out and buy laser frequency combs as position instruments for laboratories and with such an instrument you can measure the frequency of virtually any laser, any optical frequency with the precision of a microwave clock, a reference clock. So with, with this tool, the hydrogen spectroscopy becomes easy. Uh, nowadays we can also buy a laser at the right wavelengths, 243 nanometers, uh, starting with a diet laser and two stages of frequency doubling. So you send this light, as before, into a vacuum chamber where you have the hydrogen beam. You observe your metastable signal. And you can measure the frequency of light at the same time by looking at a beat note between the laser and a chosen comb line. And so with this, it really becomes easy to record a spectrum. Previously, since the line is so narrow, one had to be sort of lucky to hit the resonance. And it, the lasers would drift, and you uh, always had to chase the resonance. Now one can park the laser at any frequency you like and observe lines as this one, which is not quite symmetric. It's uh, asymmetric because of second order Doppler broadening. Uh, to reduce this, we can use our time delay trick to look at slower atoms. And so for different time delays, I get different resonance curves. For long delays, of course, the signal becomes weaker, but the line becomes narrower and much more symmetric. And there are line shape models that you can fit to this whole uh, series of observed resonances to determine the absolute frequency. And this is now <coughs> has now been done with an uncertainty of 10 hertz at Lyman Alpha. Uh, as a reference, we used the primary cesium atomic fountain clock of the German National Metrology Institute in Braunschweig, and we actually established a fiber link for this clock comparison. One has to take into account the gravitational redshift, uh, the height difference between Munich and Braunschweig gives us a shift of 4.4 times 10 to minus 14. And this is uh, the prototype now of a growing network of European fiber lengths uh, that allow clock comparisons between different metrology labs. Maybe I will not tell too much about how this was done. Just briefly, that the accuracy of optical atomic clocks is now exceeding that of the best microwave clocks of, uh, by, by two orders of magnitude <coughs> in the laboratory of Chun Ye in Boulder or Hidetoshi Katori uh, at Riken in Japan. Uh, people are comparing two <coughs> optical atomic clocks <coughs> to that level and if you take one clock and lift it by one centimeter, you can detect a change in clock rate, which is disturbing in a way, but it's of course required by general relativity. 
So we have a very accurate measurement. Now we want to compare this with theory. And hydrogen, of course, is the simplest of the atoms, so we expect the theory to be simple. And it is, according to Bohr and Schrodinger, the energy levels just in atomic units uh, are given by one over the principal quantum number square. According to Dirac, it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, we, if you look at S states without orbital angular momentum, we can uh, expand the Dirac solution as a power series in terms of the fine structure constant alpha that was introduced by Sommerfeld to explain the observed fine structure in atomic hydrogen. So uh, this is a little bit uh, more complicated, <coughs> but it's by far not complete. I also need to worry about the recoil of the nucleus in this two-body system, so then it becomes more complicated. And of course, there are relativistic corrections to the recoil. And up to this point, I have not worried about lamp shifts, about radiative correction. So let's see how it goes on. So if I look at the self-energy and vacuum polarization and two-photon corrections and three-photon corrections, radiative recoil correction, nuclear self-energy, the polarizability and the nuclear size, it gets out of hand. And it's still not complete. There's still uncalculated higher order terms. So uh, what can we then tell about the ground state of atomic hydrogen? Here we have the numerical values for these different terms and the uncertainties. And by far, the biggest uncertainty is due to the finite size of the proton. Uh, there are uncorrected, uh, uncalculated two-loop corrections and radiative recoil corrections that would come in uh, but as long as we don't know the size of the proton, nobody feels compelled to pursue these calculations. Uh, if we want to measure the size of the proton by hydrogen spectroscopy, we can take advantage of the fact that the energy, say, of S states uh, go with Rydberg constant over n square plus lamp shift terms over n cube. And the ground state lamp shift uh, contains an effect due to the finite size of the proton. This is by convention. So as we go to higher states, uh, we can take advantage of this different scaling and use two different transitions to measure the two unknowns, the Rydberg constant and the ground state lamp shift, and this is the proton size. And this has been done in a number of experiments. And so here is now the result of such experiments directly expressed in terms of the proton charge radius. And uh, so we have a whole series of results. And uh, what one can do is determine the average. And so this is the average that enters into the official co-data value of the proton size. And people didn't see much reason to worry until uh, almost 10 years ago or so, uh, the proton size was determined in muonic hydrogen, a man-made exotic hydrogen atom where the electron is replaced by a muon that is 200 times heavier. And there is a discrepancy of four sigma. The discrepancy is even bigger, it's 7.9 sigma, if he takes the official co-data value for the proton size, which uh, considers not only hydrogen spectroscopy, but also the results of electron scattering experiments at accelerators. And so this is what was, has become known as the proton size puzzle, that the proton seems to have shrunk. It's about 4% smaller in radius than officially stated. The uh, Munich experiments uh, are carried out at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, where there is a strong source of muons. And if one shoots these into a hydrogen gas, you can produce a few muonic hydrogen atoms in the metastable 2S state. Uh, muons are 200 times heavier, so the energy levels are 200 times farther apart. 
Lyman alpha is now at two kilo electron volts, and the lamp shift is uh, accessible with an infrared laser at six microns. And if you remember hydrogen, he, it actually has the opposite sign. That is because vacuum fluctuations cannot do much with the heavy muon, but vacuum polarization becomes the dominant effect, so that the theory actually is somewhat easier for muonic uh, lamp shifts than for electronic lamp shifts. Here is a picture of the experimental hall at the Powell Scherer Institute, and here is a small part of an international team of about 30 scientists who are celebrating the first observation of the uh, six micron lampshade resonance in muonic hydrogen. Uh, it took about 10 years to get to this point, but now one is left with a contradiction. Uh, just last year, the collaboration published related results for muonic deuterium, and uh, it turns out also the deuteron is smaller than expected from spectroscopy in deuterium or from electron scattering experiments. And uh, now we can look at the discrepancy, uh, how much would we need to move the transitions to uh, make this puzzle go away. And for the hydrogen one is two transition, it means we would have to move it by 40 line weights. It's impossible that one can have made a mistake of that magnitude. For the mionic lamp shift, one still would have to move the resonance by four line width. Uh, but for the hydrogen transitions, the auxiliary transitions, in order to det determine the proton size from hydrogen spectroscopy, it's much less. So for the 2s, 4p transition, uh, one only would have to move it by uh, part in 10 to the 3 or so. So if something is went wrong, maybe it went wrong with this type of hydrogen spectroscopy. And uh, therefore, in our laboratory, we are trying to redo some of these spectroscopy experiments with our advanced tools to see if maybe the puzzle can be made to go away. And the first experiment uh, that has led to some results, and it's actually a paper accepted in science, uh, is uh, the thesis work of Axel Bayer, who uh, looked at the 2s to 4p transition as an auxiliary transition. And uh, you can observe this by looking at the emission of Lyman gamma photons from the upper state. It's a single photon transition, uh, so it's uh, probable but not narrow. And uh, that's why one has to determine uh, the line center very well. In order to look at this transition, we take advantage of the 1s, 2s apparatus that we have looked at before, but now we add another laser at the wavelengths of 972, which after frequency doubling gives us the Balmer beta line. And this light is used to excite fluorescence in a metastable beam of atoms. So here is a sketch. We have a cold hydrogen beam. In previous experiments, the uh, hydrogen atoms were excited by electron collisions, and their uh, motion was not well controlled. But here we have nice, optically excited cold hydrogen atoms, and we excite them at right angles with blue light, and in order to cancel first order Doppler shifts, we use a very well controlled uh, standing wave of forward and backward running waves. The Lyman gamma photons are uh, detected uh, by photocathodes and uh, electron multipliers, <coughs> and the detector actually is split into two parts so that one can compare the signals from photons emitted in, di in different directions. And that has to do with a term that has been neglected in almost all previous precision measurement, but uh, that is important in our particular case, and that is what's called cross-stamping or quantum interference. If you have two lines 
two resonances some distance apart, then we expect that each line will be affected a little bit because it's on the, body, on the pedestal, on the wing of the other. But if we go sufficiently far apart, uh, we can ignore that. Unfortunately, it's not so easy because we cannot simply add the intensities. We have <coughs> to add the amplitudes and square. And if we do that, we get some Fano-like interference effect that can distort and shift lines. So in case of our 2S4P transition, we look at photons corresponding to the emission of pi polarized radiation or sigma plus or sigma minus polarized radiation, and they have different angular patterns. And as a result, these Fano interference distortions are different in different emission directions. And so for that purpose, we split the detector and we can look at the signals from the two halves. And indeed, as we rotate the polarization of the exciting laser, there are line shifts and not insignificant line shifts. Uh, here, uh, it's nine times the magnitude of the discrepancy uh, due to the proton size. So if we would ignore this, it would be very bad. But since we understand it now, we can model it, uh, one can uh, tell the magnitude of, of the defect. If you simply fit your lines to a Fano void profile, you already make uh, these variations almost go away. And so, uh, what is the preliminary result of such a fit? So it looks like shown here in blue. It looks like the new measurement is in agreement with the mionic uh, charge radius. Of course, we cannot be sure, uh, but uh, I mean, let's, uh, for the sake of argument, play through the, through the scenario where the mionic proton radius would be correct. So uh, what does it mean? Uh, the measured mionic hydrogen proton radius gave rise to the proton radius puzzle. In deuterium, we also have a puzzle, so, so to speak. There are new experiments, not yet published, in mionic helium, in hydrogen-like mionic helium ions, uh, which give the charge radius of the alpha particle. And uh, here, there is no discrepancy. We get the expected radius. So uh, it could be that simply the puzzle is due to some errors in previous experiments. Uh, then there would be no new physics, which in a way is sad. But it would imply that the proton radius from mionic hydrogen is correct, that in hydrogen spectroscopy maybe the error was underestimated, and there is still the question of the accelerator experiment. I cannot, of course, speak for that community, but it would imply that also there the error was underestimated. If he makes that assumption, what does it mean for the Rydberg constant? Here is the official uh, co-data Rydberg constant from the 2014 adjustment. And with our new proton size from ionic hydrogen, the Rydberg constant would be consider considerably more accurate, but shifted. And uh, if we assume we made a mistake in the previous determination, the old error bars would have to increase. So, uh, it, in our evolution of the Rydberg constant, we would now approach uh, 10 to the minus 12 or so. Of course, we cannot be sure. And uh, we need to do further experiments to either resolve or confirm this photon radius puzzle. There are also interesting tests of quantum electrodynamics with other hydrogen-like systems. In our particular laboratory with Thomas Udem, we are trying to observe the 1s, 2s transition in hydrogen-like helium ions at the vacuum ultraviolet at 60.8 nanometers. It's a fairly challenging experiment, but it's coming along. Uh, another interesting question is, now that we have these super optical clocks, which still would require a redefinition of the unit of time to, to actually uh, uh, 
the usable. Uh, can we push the accuracy of hydrogen spectroscopy to uh, take advantage of, of these new possibilities? And why would one want to do it? Uh, well, one good reason, I think, is that now similar spectroscopy of anti-hydrogen has moved within reach, and the tiniest difference, even if it's at the 20th decimal place, between hydrogen and anti-hydrogen would shake our fundamental beliefs in physics. It would violate uh, Einstein and uh, the standard model, and uh, it would, would definitely be worth investing quite some effort to push the accuracy uh, to the level where one can observe some difference. Just this year, the Alpha collaboration at CERN has already published two nature papers on first spectroscopy of anti-hydrogen, of cold, magnetically trapped anti-hydrogen atoms. The first paper is on the 1s, 2s resonance uh, that they can determine to a part in 10 to 10 already, and very likely much better in the near future. And uh, in the second experiment, they give a first uh, result for the microwave resonance in the ground state, the hyperfine splitting. So uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, what, how symmetric nature is at this level. And with this, I conclude. I want to thank my sponsors, the European Research Council, the Max Planck Foundation, and the Carl Friedrich von Siemens Foundation, who all have helped me to continue working, even though in Germany I would have had to retire 10 years ago. And I thank you for your attention and for allowing me to see beautiful work life. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. We have time for questions or comments. Is there a question? Perhaps I can ask a question if there is no. Is there a question in the audience? Okay, go ahead. Hello, thank you for the lecture. How do you like want to measure or investigate the gravitational forces with the spectroscopy of anti-hydrogen? Uh, well, I mean, the, the difficulty so far is that there are only very few atoms, and uh, they require different methods of spectroscopy than for ordinary hydrogen. But in, since I know where this resonance is, and I have the beautiful frequency comb and all the tools. I can tune the laser on resonance and what they did, 100 kilohertz off resonance, and see if there is a difference in lifetime. If you hit the resonance, there is a certain chance that you ionize the atom and it will uh, disappear from the magnetic trap. And so by looking at the survival rate as a function of frequency, they have been able to pin down the optical resonance within 100 kilohertz, but uh, simply because they didn't have much time. And this year, I think their goal is to do 10 times better. And in the future, I don't see why you could not do as well as for ordinary hydrogen. You have one advantage that the signature, uh, the annihilation signature of anti-hydrogen atoms is a big event that is difficult to overlook. And, and therefore, very few atoms can give you a robust signal. Yes, please. This is a very naive question, but is this uh, radius of hydrogen a fundamental physical constant, or it, it may be somehow expressed through other constants? And this concept of having such a huge accuracy of a radius is a kind of uh, strange to me, because what does it mean that we have a border between existing proton and the rest of the world? Right. And of course, I mean, 
we don't know if the system of constants changes, how it changes, whether it's the fine structure constant or something else. But one can see if there is any indication that perhaps the fine structure constant changes, and there have been indications from astronomical observations that maybe the fine structure constant was different in the early universe. And therefore, uh, we've tried to think how, how would we detect in the laboratory a change of the fine structure constant. And you can do that, for instance, by comparing optical transitions from different elements, or even within the same uh, atom, two different transitions. Uh, the very first laboratory experiments that gave some significant result were actually carried out in our laboratory with hydrogen. But quickly, it became clear that other sharper transitions used by the clock community give you a better handle. And uh, of course, as time goes on, also the time base over which one can compare is increasing. So I think right now the uncertainty, or, or we know that the fine structure constant cannot change by more than 10 to the minus 17 per year. That is the current limit. Because we also don't know if it changes, if it changes uniformly with time, or if it changed much in the early universe and is stable now. We have no idea. So this is really fishing in an unknown pond. Any further questions? Yes, please. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I would like to ask you, looking for a symmetry between a matter and, and an antimatter is, of course, looking for, the asymm for symmetry breaking, which may explain baryogenesis and, and things like that. Um, are there any predictions at this point uh, that, for example, lines of uh, hydrogen and anti-hydrogen anti should be shifted by, I don't know, 10 to minus? Are we, are we actually uh, heading for, a, for a particular you number? See some some change. Uh, well, uh, maybe we know very little about our gravitational forces on antimatter. And uh, if we uh, uh, try to say what would what be the difference due to gravitational forces, some people speculate that antimatter will fall up rather than down. And actually, some cosmology has been worked out with this assumption that antimatter falls up, then you don't need inflation or dark energy. But so what would it mean if anti-hydrogen would fall up rather than down? <coughs> I would assume if CPT symmetry holds, uh, anti-hydrogen and hydrogen should behave the same far away from gravitational fields. The outside our galaxy, they might be the same. Now to bring them in, the hydrogen atom would fall due to gravity, so it would have a mass defect due to binding, and the anti-atom would have to be pushed in, so it would gain energy, and its mass should increase. And so if I think of the position of our solar system in the galaxy, I think the change would be 10 to the minus 6. So it would be a very big change, and we don't see anything of that kind. So we, I think we can rule out that antimatter falls up, but there are different models of gravitational forces that would allow for some small differences in gravitational <coughs> effects. So this, this could be one source of difference. If we still want to keep CPT symmetry, but of course we don't know up to what level this symmetry holds. Thank you. We, we shall thank Professor Hans again.